I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Linda Gorski, and I am the president of the Houston Archaeological Society, and I'd like to welcome you to the meeting tonight. But I also want to tell you about our speaker for February, February 18th, 2021, is historian and author Gary Pinkerton, who's going to be talking about Trammell's Trace, the first road from Texas to the north. So we encourage you to join us for that meeting as well. Now tonight, our speaker for tonight is Wilson W. Dubcrook, and he's going to speak on the anthropology of hunting. So Dubcrook is a longtime member of the Dallas, Houston, and Texas Archaeological Societies. Dub came into archaeologically archaeology practically at birth since his dad, Wilson W. Bill Crook Jr was past president and fellow of the Texas Archaeological Society and one of the pioneering researchers on the archaeology of the Upper Trinity watershed. Dub received his Bachelor of Science degree in geology, mineralogy from Southern Methodist University and conducted his graduate studies in mineralogy and rare earth crystal chemistry at the University of Michigan. Besides his membership in local archeological societies, he is also a member of the Center for Studies of the First Americans, a life member of GALT, a fellow of the Texas Archeological Research Laboratory in Austin and a fellow of the Leakey Foundation. Dub has published 251 professional papers, 183 of them in the field of archeology. span while his archaeological research has focused primarily on the Upper Trinity River watershed, he has also worked on sites in Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, California, and Virginia. Tonight, Dub, shall I stop share? <laughs> Tonight, Dub will combine his archaeological knowledge with his in-depth global hunting experience to talk about prehistoric hunting, animal behavior, and the various hunting techniques that are required to successfully stalk and kill wild game. In his presentation, Dub will discuss hunting tactics for dangerous game, buffaloes, bears, cats, plains game animals, mammoths and mastodon, mountain game and small game animals. He'll discuss the risks and rewards facing the prehistoric peoples and how this impacted their hunting methods, strategies, and decisions. He will also describe the many factors such as weather, wind, cover, ground terrain, and water and food availability that affect hunting. The objective of the talk is to give HAS members and guests, especially non-hunters, a better appreciation of the difficulties faced by our prehistoric inhabitants on a daily basis. This talk was the basis for a class taught by Mr. Crook to anthropology students at the University of Texas at Arlington. I give you Dub Crook. Thank you, Linda. Um, actually, this uh, came out of a, uh, a semester class that my uh, good friend, Ashley Lemke was teaching at uh, UT Arlington. And uh, she sent me the syllabus of it. And my only comment back to her was I said, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you've actually had someone who had experience hunting some of these animals to talk to your students about um, the dangers or what you need to think about or risk reward situations, which are the things that our um, prehistoric ancestors uh, uh, really knew a great deal about. And so Ashley turned around and said, well, you know, rather than me learning it, why don't you just come and teach that class? So um, that's what it, this is stemming from, is what I taught the students in their uh, semester class. And like Lyndall read in there, I'm not really going to argue the merits or uh, fight with anybody over the morals associated with hunting versus non-hunting or whatever. But we have to realize that um, virtually all of the artifacts we find at, at prehistoric sites whether they be dart or arrow points, uh, scrapers, uh, you know, gouges, whatever, they all are more or less uh, associated with the act of hunting and or its byproducts, such as cr uh, creating cutting meat or producing hides for clothing and that sort of thing. So hunting was a real um, activity. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna do today is um, talk to you about um, some of the aspects that are related to it based on my global experiences. Now, 
You all know, as Linda read ad nauseum, the things that I have done uh, associated with archaeology, but you may not know that I can equally speak about uh, hunting because I have hunted on all six continents around the world, uh, taken a large number of different species, including all of the dangerous game animals that are present in um, Africa, some with uh, some very interesting, very close quarter experiences. Um, I've hunted a number of the smaller antelope species. And so I think combined with my archeology, span I have probably have a unique um, aspect of being able to look at hunting, uh, both the way it's done today and the way our prehistoric uh, the antecedents did. Uh, so with that, I wanna start with just talking about some basics connected with hunting. First of all, what is hunting? Well, clearly it's the activity of pursuing and killing wild game for either subsistence or today sport. If we're talking about uh, prehistoric, obviously there wasn't sport associated with it. It was clearly subsistence because you either were successful and ate or you starved to death. Um, there are generally in terms of hunting, there are three basic categories. There's subsistence, which is what we're gonna focus on tonight of which there's no ethics involved. Um, the object is to put meat on the table. So you don't care if you're killing uh, young or females or you're running a whole herd over the cliff that there's more meat than you can eat. Um, all that you want to do is to be able to survive. Um, then there's sport and trophy hunting, which is today, which is totally different. It is incredibly highly regulated with very strict codes and game laws. And unfortunately, the things that make the press are the people who break those laws and the penalties for breaking these laws, both in this country as well as other around the world are extremely severe, uh, literally in the hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines with confiscation of all of your weapons and all of your trophies. So uh, it is a very highly regulated uh, activity. And then there is wildlife management are called culling which is usually done by government edict where there are too many animals given a certain um, range of, of, of habitat. And um, it's essentially a government um, uh, forced edict of going out and killing as many as they can to get down to the level they think the land can support. Um, I understand the methods of it. I have come across in Africa many times where uh, government troops went out and essentially machine gunned down uh, elephants, and I literally broke down crying, watching, seeing the rotting bones and things that were left. Um, I'm not going to obviously talk about that tonight. So we're going to focus on subsistence um, and all the activities that are associated with that. All right, the types of game animals that are available. I have broken them out into four general categories. There's dangerous game. These are animals that uh, when you're hunting them, given half a chance, um, they can turn on you and um, your life is on very high, high risk. Even in modern day hunting, when you have high tech rifles and everything else, um, some of these can be very, very close. And there are people, both professional hunters and, and other hunters who are killed uh, annually because of this. And there's those consist of the proboscideans, the elephants, the bovids around the world, such as the Cape buffalo in Africa, the bison here in North America, the water buffaloes in South America and Asia, and then in Southeast Asia, the bantang and the gowers. Uh, the big cats, lion and leopard in Africa, tiger in India and Asia, jaguars in South America and our mountain lion. Uh, rhinos, hippos, crocs, gators, uh, bears, and then the other ones that you don't normally think of but can very well uh, do good damage to you, which are wolves and especially uh, wild uh, pigs. Uh, then there's the plains game, which I have cut off at 50 pounds and larger, uh, which consists of the deer family, uh, the caribou uh, and their related reindeer, all the antelopes around the world, the gazelles, and then the things that you throw in there like the giraffe, the zebras, and uh, the wild horse, which may not be a game animal today, but clearly was uh, back in the Pleistocene. And then you have mountain game, which are basically the sheep, goats, and then there are related 
things of ibexes and markhors and aodods and the little chamois that live up in the uh, mountains in Europe. And I will show you all of these. And then anything smaller than 50 pounds, I've just lumped into small game, which are usually the miniature antelopes um, and then things like uh, squirrels and rabbits and all of those sort of things. All right, the big game, you can obviously see here with the elephants and the cape buffs and the, the lions and leopards and, and all. Um, these are various examples of plains game around the world. In the upper left is a kudu. You have the white-tailed deer and the eland in the far right. And then coming down the right-hand side, you have a black buck, which is common to India and Pakistan. Um, the sable is the beautiful dark one down there in the lower right, the elk in the middle, and then of course, obviously the zebra and the caribou. And there are many sub varieties of all of these. There's like four sub varieties of zebra and there's uh, five, I believe, of caribou. Then you have the mountain games, which are the really exotic ones like the Marco Polo sheep, which is the upper left uh, that live up in the Pamir mountains of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzia. Um, you have the ibexes, which is the one in the upper middle um, you have the Urials, which are those sheep in the far right-hand corner, and that photo is taken in, uh, uh, um, no, where was that? Uh, Turkmenistan, yeah, Turkmenistan. The Markors are the one in the lower right with the corkscrew antelope. The Shamis are the one in the little center. It's, they're actually uh, uh, a small little goat um, that live in the high uh, mountains there in Europe from Spain up through uh, Switzerland. And then, of course, we have four varieties of wild sheep, uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn, desert bighorn, doll, and stone sheep that live here in North America. And then, of course, the small game are the pygmy antelope, which you can see around here, which are the dikers and the uh, stenbucks and things like that. And then, of course, rabbits and squirrels and many other things that also were caught and can be eaten. All right, why hunt? Well, obviously the reason for hunting is the rewards that you get from it. And the rewards are first and obvious is meat as well as bone marrow for protein and calories. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Uh, fat, which is an important ingredient in many hunter gatherer societies. Uh, we always think we're overfed and we don't want fat, but fat is a premium thing that uh, many societies literally uh, would kill for. Uh, the use of bones to make tools as well as shelter, uh, sinew, which can be made into to things like bowstrings and weapons, also used in clothing and shelter, as well as hides for clothing and shelter. Now, every time for the rewards are out there, there are sometimes risks associated with that. And when you're hunting, you have to weigh the reward versus the risk. And Obviously that leads to serious injury up to and including being killed. Um, the calories that you expend uh, during the hunt. Obviously if you expend, let's say 3000 calories to take a game animal that you get 2000 calories of benefit from, the answer is you can't keep that up because you'll starve to death. So um, you have to always be taking into account how much calories you're going to expend versus the reward. And part of that calories expended is in the transport of the products once the kill has been made. And prior to the uh, introduction of the reintroduction, I should say, of the horse in historic times uh, to this continent, uh, that involved a really major effort and led to some specialized things um, in terms of uh, dried meat products called biltong, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, why did hunting develop and the processing or gathering of meat? Anthropologists have debated this for years, but it, they have estimated that as much as 20 to 25 percent of the calories that you intake every day are needed to keep your brain functioning. So with human evolution and development, the advent of a larger brain over time had a corresponding need for a greater calorie intake that plant products just couldn't keep up with. And therefore, um, meat, first from scavenging, but then very quickly afterwards from hunting was um, necessity. All right, I mentioned this is biltong. 
Um, it is commonly done in Africa today. Um, usually when I'm hunting in Africa, this is, you know, strips of biltong as well as an apple. That's about all I need for the day. Um, they are just air dried. It's not really like jerky at all. It can be salted and seasoned on the one on the, uh, on the right hand side, you can see on the strips of meat, some of the uh, peppercorns and things there, but oftentimes it's just air dried. And it's surprising how much moisture is associated with meat. And when you reduce the moisture out of it to just its basic uh, product, um, you can transport a lot more of it than you can uh, cut meat like you and I would buy out of the uh, grocery store. And so I'm a firm believer that, that this was an advent of a long time ago. And this was a way that hunters could easily carry uh, meat back uh, to those in camp that didn't participate um, in the hunt. All right, the weapons, the traditional weapons um, of our prehistoric ancestors, uh, we have the spear, uh, either for thrusting or throwing. Um, and we now believe that they go back as far as five to 600,000 years ago. Um, if you were in our society several years ago, I gave a presentation on these uh, three Fowersmith industry sites I excavated in uh, the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And uh, they have some of the oldest um, stone points that are known. Later on, we of course developed the, the thrower, a dart thrower um, with the atl, -atl uh, which actually has a range of much more than a hundred yards, but effectively when you're hunting, um, it's much more effective than the throwing spear. And then ultimately the development of the bow and arrow, which has a variable range, but both the effectiveness and its range is really dependent on the bow itself. And until strong bows were being made primarily out of uh, bodark wood here in North America, um, a lot of times we see in, in uh, uh, excavations, the coexistence of both bow and arrows and atlatls and dart uh, primarily for one having a, a heavier hitting power. But once a strong bow was developed, then obviously uh, you did not need the atlatl uh, anymore. And of course, all of these can be used with or without the addition of poison. And I'm gonna talk about this in a minute from some neat observations I had in Namibia. Um, we don't really think about use of poisons, but I almost would guarantee you that poisons were used in North America in the prehistoric past. We just don't typically check our artifacts for them. Uh, there is one uh, uh, lady who's a uh, um, professor in England uh, with the interesting name of, of uh, Valentina Borgia. Yes, coming from the Borgia family, famous for using poisons. But she has studied poisons and artifacts across uh, Europe and in Africa and has found them um, present on a good number of prehistoric uh, uh, weapons. And then of course, in modern day, we have rifles, um, which are totally different. Um, and I'll show you as we go through the big game animals where rifles can be used that couldn't have been done back in prehistoric times. But the key to all of these weapons, the key to hunting itself is shot placement, knowing the anatomy of the animal and then gaining penetration. And of course the points, whether they be spear points, dart points or an arrow point, their whole function is simply to penetrate the skin. Then it is the diameter of the dart or the arrow shaft combined with the force that hits it that then creates the wound to that ultimately determines whether you can kill or not the animal. All right, and you can see these weapons, um, the uh, spear there in the lower or upper left, the atlatl on the caribou there, and then you see, of course, the bow and arrow. And when the horse came in, you didn't really need a strong long range bow because you could ride right next to the buffalo like our Plains Indians did and shoot it all the way through the buffalo from short range. All right, these are some of these Fowersmith industry points. Um, the type site at Katupan up in the northern part of South Africa, those are points down in the lower photo. 
Uh, the upper photo are three that I excavated at Dalmanuta uh, in the Eastern Cape. They're very primitive, but they are clearly made uh, for hafting. These are intentionally made little notches right here to help uh, facilitate the, uh, the hafting and some of the earliest um, probably throwing or, or stabbing type uh, uh, spears. All right, this is what I alluded to about the use of poison. Um, I had a very interesting hunt in Namibia and we got to, to interact with um, some of the native people. And in actually in the Northern part of South Africa, I also got to interact with both uh, two kinds of people, the San and the uh, Kung. Now in reality, they talk um, with clicks and clacks that they make using their tongue. And so when you see it in print, the Kung is always followed by an exclamation point, which is really a popping of your mouth like that. So it's the Kung like that. Anyway, they're generally referred to in, in Western press as being the Bushman people, but they're very distinct. Um, anyway, I got to follow through and see this process um, in person. And you can see on the upper left, what they search for is these buried uh, chrysalis of the beetle uh, diamphidia. And they tear off this brown blackish coating and they get the grubs out of them. And they take the grubs and they use something. This happens to be a socket bone of a gemsbok, a, a antelope. And they uh, crush the chrysalis in it and mix it with a little bit of water. And then they take that liquid that they get and they carefully coat it onto the arrow points and along the upper part of the shaft of their little arrows. And then they take those arrows and they heat them over a fire. And it turns to, the poison turns to a black, uh, tar-like coating. And then they go out hunting. And you can see they have very flimsy little bows that you would say, well, gee, that won't shoot into any animal. And that's right. They don't. They only go in a few inches. But that's all they need to do because the poison, once it gets into the bloodstream of the animal, it is 100% fatal with no known antidote to it. And so um, uh, they... Uh, they will trail, they will shoot like into a large animal, like a giraffe, and they will shoot it into its stomach. And uh, once they get the arrow in there, they may have to trail the animal for a week before it dies, but it is, it is walking dead, literally. So I don't discount the fact that we see this today, and I have actually witnessed it, as obviously from these pictures. Um, I, I don't discount the fact that we probably are missing archeologically uh, poisons that were present um, in the prehistoric sites. All right, the types of hunting. Um, there I've listed there the, the, the five basic types. There's spot and stalk, where you get up usually on a high place and you spot animals and then you determine a stalk using terrain uh, for cover, use of camouflage. Um, and when you're walking toward animals, most animals are not terribly disturbed by one person, especially if they keep a low profile. In other words, hunkered down as they walk. If there were 10 people, they would get upset and run. But if you keep a single file, uh, they really only see one person. So um, you have to be very careful in the way you approach. Then there's of course ambush hunting, which is the use of a, a stand either a, up in a tree or building a, a hide of some type, a blind. Uh, the use of baiting, that's a modern technique, not used terribly much in the prehistoric past simply because you had to expend either meat or grain as the bait. And if you're a subsistence hunting society, you don't waste things like that. And then there are calls. Um, it is fascinating to hunt. You don't see this very much in North America, but in Africa, almost all of your African trackers can make incredible numbers of calls using just their nose and pressing on the nose or, and vocalizations. And they can make animal calls in distress or little animal bleats and things like that that will bring animals uh, in. Then there are drives where you literally get a group of people who, instead of being stealthy, make as much noise as possible and drive animals down to a trap 
uh, where the hunters are, who hopefully then will get a chance. Or as uh, one of Linda's last diagrams, when she was introducing me showed, uh, you run them over a jump uh, to their death. Then there is tracking. Uh, we don't see this as much in North America, but in Africa, almost all hunting is done by tracking. And you cut the spore or the tracks of an animal, and then you follow it up because even the largest of animals, they cannot walk all day long and they will stop either to rest or to uh, eat. And when they do, if you're following it carefully, you can catch up to them even if you start off way behind. And then of course with small game, you can uh, trap them or uh, use snares. When you're hunting, you have to have a number of things that you keep in mind. Uh, the wind is probably the most important. Uh, you always stalk either downwind or crosswind to an animal. If you're upwind of an animal, the human scent gets to them and they will uh, invariably uh, run long before you can get in range, um, even with a rifle. To the, the weather plays a great deal to do when you're hunting, um, whether it's rain or wind or snow. Um, animals are like us. If you don't like to be out in cold, windy, wet weather, they don't like it either, with one exception, and that's caribou. Caribou are impervious to weather. Um, the full moon is an important thing because if you have a full moon and it's, it's not overcast, animals will feed all night and then they will lay up in the, in the day and uh, when you're hunting out there, you'll wind up saying, I don't see a thing, when in reality, there may be animals all around, they're just not up and moving around. And of course, natural events like wildfires uh, will uh, uh, push animals uh, away, almost like a drive will. Uh, the use of cover, uh, you try to avoid walking in open areas as much as possible. So you move at the edge of open areas through trees and bush and tall grass. Uh, using terrain, it's surprising that even what looks flat may invariably have very small little shallows or uh, hollows in it that you can um, approach an animal uh, low to the ground and he will not see you. Uh, water availability and sources of water. If there are not water around, there won't be animals. So there's no sense in hunting in an area where you don't, where you know there's no water. Same thing with available food for the animals. You know, if there's not enough game for uh, uh, predators, um, you won't find any predators to hunt. Um, obviously the ground type is important, um, especially if you're talking about hard ground uh, versus uh, uh, more soft soil or sand. Uh, tracking, which is so important, is very difficult to do over rocks or hard ground. Um, and then of course, human scent. Um, uh, most animals um, have an abhorrence of human scent and they will, uh, uh, they will run the moment they get to it, especially if they're an area where they have been hunted uh, before because they will remember that. Um, it's the one reason that you don't see a lot of the dangerous animals beginning off as being man-eaters. Man-eaters are invariably uh, primarily leopards and uh, lions and occasionally tigers. Um, it, they turn to it when they have been seriously injured and they are no longer able to kill their natural prey. And so their starvation overcomes their abhorrence of the smell of human beings. And then once they kill one, they find out how ridiculously easy we are to kill because we don't run fast, we don't climb very well, um, you know, we don't have any claws to fight back or anything like that. And then you have a problem because then you have a man-eater and some of them are very effective. There was a man-eater leopard in India back in the 1940s and 50s that uh, before it was finally uh, cornered and killed, it took 425 villagers across one area of India. All right, let's talk about the hunting the animals and what you need to know about them. So we'll start off with dangerous game. And by the way, I have no gory photos in here except one, and I will give you fair warning on it, but this animal is not dead. This rhino is perfectly alive. 
I was working with South Africa on a um, uh, conservation project uh, connected with rhinos. And the rifle I have in my hand is a dart gun. And he is completely out. Uh, and we collected all kinds of scientific data uh, on him from his blood and everything. And then at the base of his large forward horn, we embedded a, uh, a tracking chip in it so that he could be tracked for his range. All right, let's start off with the proboscideans, elephant and then in the, in the uh, Pleistocene, mammoths and mastodon. Um, they are very high risk because they are extremely dangerous to hunt. Um, you can obviously understand it. Here's an animal that, that weighs five tons uh, and you weigh a piddling, you know, 100 to 200 pounds, um, but it's huge high reward because obviously you have a five ton animal that has a lot of meat. Um, they have very poor eyesight, but superb hearing. They use, they use those big ears to funnel in sound and they have extraordinary smell using that trunk. They are deceptively fast. You never see an elephant run. They kind of just trot, but they can do it for all day. An elephant can, can move 60 miles in one 24 hour period if, he, if he's motivated to do so. <clears throat> so they have incredible stamina. Uh, the types of hunting, uh, elephants usually occur as lone groups of bulls or a single bull or in a herd, which is primarily except in the breeding season, cows and calves. And they're entirely different um, hunting situations. Obviously, if you're hunting a herd, of cows and calves, there are a lot more eyes and ears and, and noses to see you. And invariably somewhere in the matriarch group, there will be a cow or more that for one reason or another, genetics or something, never grew any tusks at all. Now, female elephants grow smaller tusks than males, but some females are known to be completely tussless. And it's almost like they are born with a chip on their shoulder. The most dangerous elephants that you can find are tussless cows because if they sense any danger at all, they have this innate sense of, I guess, an inferiority complex and they will charge without reason. And uh, the only way that you can stop them is either they kill you or you kill them. Uh, and then the bulls are a whole nother thing. Normally they can be approached unless they're in the breeding season when they go into a situation called must. And that is what an elephant looks like uh, in must. Behind the eye, they have a um, oil gland. And when they are in the breeding season, that oil gland gets excited and it's pumping hormones through them. And when you see an elephant with that drainage like that, they are ready to fight anything. And uh, they are extremely dangerous to approach during that part of the, of the year. Now in hunting elephants, typically what you do is you track them. Um, elephants make big prints. They're usually fairly easy to track, only you better be prepared to do a lot of walking. Um, I've always been told that um, uh, for every pound of ivory that the tusks are, that's a mile that you need to walk. And so typically an elephant hunt, you'll spend somewhere between 50 and 100 miles of walking to try to catch up to, to one unless you can ambush them at a water hole, but that's um, kind of iffy. Um, kill zones, we'll talk about this in a minute, uh, is the brain or the heart lung sh uh, shot. For rifles, only a rifle can do the brain shot. Prehistorically, they did not have a weapon that could penetrate through the skull to be able to do that. But heart lungs uh, definitely was so, and I will show you this here in a second. Um, elephants will, Elephants don't like to be approached up to a point. If you get close enough to them, and especially if they catch your scent, they will do a demonstration charge. And here on the left, this is a demonstration charge. Note that the ears are folded back and the trunk is up and he'll thrash his head, he'll kick soil. He really is just telling you, you're too close to me, I want you to go away. But if you ever see an elephant like the one in the right-hand picture, where the ears come up and he curls the tusk back like that, 
That's not a demonstration. He is coming to kill you. And nothing is going to stop the charge until one of two things happen. Either you kill him or he kills you. And um, that's, of course, an obviously very dangerous situation that you try to avoid. Um, here's some elephant anatomy. Um, you can think of mammoths and mastodons being very similar. Um, the brain, as I mentioned, it's about the size of a loaf of bread that's elongate like this through the elephant side. It, it's parallel with the ear holes. And if you're using a rifle, what they tell you to do is elephant trunks have creases in them and you, you aim at the, at the top crease and that will hit the brain. Now, obviously, if you've got an atlatl or a spear, you're not gonna go through all that bone. So then you're restricted to heart lung shot. Fortunately, elephants being very large animal have got huge hearts and lung. And what you line up is you need to be quartering away from him where you can see the crease in his front leg and then put it in here. And then you will go into a lot of tracking and hope after you do that, he doesn't turn on you. Um, obviously, if you have poison, you can hit him anywhere back here in the stomach and intestines, and that will also do it. But elephants have very thick hide, um, sometimes several inches thick. That's why they makes wonderful leather for shoes and wallets and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, uh, it can be penetrated with a uh, spear, an atlatl, or even an arrow. There are crazy guys who go to Africa and hunt elephants with arrows to this day and they are successful. I am not one of those person to try that. All right, the bovids, Cape buffaloes, bison, water buffalo, and then the Asian uh, banting and gowers. Uh, also very high risk. These animals, especially the bulls, are uh, short-tempered. There was a very famous um, African writer named Robert Ruark, and he wrote a book of his experiences in East Africa, in Kenya, back before, um, or actually just after World War II, and he said that Cape Buffaloes look at you like you owe them money, and uh, that's true. They're, they're just honorary animals. They have average eyesight, but superb hearing and smell, and what makes them dangerous are the next two things. They have some of the largest adrenal glands of any animals in the world. And the moment they sense danger, those glands open up and they pump their whole system full of that adrenaline. And then they have the incredible ability to store oxygen in their brain. I have seen a Cape Buffalo in Africa who was shot multiple times. And when ultimately he expired and they opened him up to skin it, his heart had been shot to tatters. He literally didn't have a working heart, but he was running around trying to kill people for several minutes before ultimately that oxygen ran out in his brain. Um, they also hunt in either lone uh, bull groups uh, called Daga boys. Uh, Daga is the uh, uh, one of the South African words for um, essentially a mud pond because uh, they love to get in and rub dirt all over themselves to protect from insects. Um, and then there's groups of cows and calves. And it's the same thing as with elephants. The larger groups has more eyes um, and ears. Um, there's a very high danger rate with a very high rate of charge, especially bulls. And following up wounded game is the most dangerous that there is. Um, there's virtually no other animal except maybe a lion that following up once wounded uh, is likely to get you killed. Um, and I'm sure that our prehistoric ancestors in Africa um, encountered this uh, up close and personal. Um, hunting method is usually either spot and stalk or tracking. Um, and then from a kill zone, I wanna show you a development that the most famous buffalo hunter in North America, Buffalo Bill determined. Um, you can see here's the Cape buffaloes in three places, and you can see here's the American buffalo, and the heart and the lungs are here. He started off, and of course you realize Buffalo Bill was working for the army and for the railroads to shoot as many of these animals as he could for meat for the workers and the soldiers. And what he found out, having not shot one before, 
is while he shot them here in the heart lung area, um, whether they dropped or not, they typically ran a little bit and they would let out a, a roar and it would spook all the other buffalo in the area. And then he would get one and he would have to then create a whole new stock situation. And he wasn't getting enough to fulfill his meat quota. So he took one of these early buffaloes and he completely dissected it. And what he found was between the base of the horn and the ear, there's a little two by two inch spot that is thin. And if shot in that area, it breaks the cervical vertebra and the buffalo just drops straight down and makes no sound. And he could actually then move and shoot 16 to 18 before finally he missed a shot and, um, and they all ran off. And that's the reason, that's how he fed uh, the railroad. Um, Cape buffaloes, the brain shot is the thing you don't want to have to do. It's, it's last resort. Um, and even though the brain is here where you shoot is through the nose to get to that. And nobody does that. Uh, the heart lungs are here. You can see the heart is very deep in the chest. There's a crease in his shoulder. You see that crease right there. That's your aiming point going into here. And that's what, what our ancestors in Africa with either atlatls or spears would be aiming for. Now, I'm coming up to show you the gory shot. If you are turned off by seeing something really deadly or bloody, uh, turn your eyes right now. But people always ask me and say, well, gee, it just looks like a cow. You know, how can a cow really be that dangerous? You see those horns that they have? They hit you when they charge, they lower their head and they hit you with that boss in the middle. And then they push you up in the air and then they hook you with these things. This is the next picture I'm gonna show is I was in Tanzania uh, hunting there and we came across these two lionesses. And this one had just run into a Cape Buffalo. And you see what that Cape Buffalo hook had done. There's one horn hook here and one there. And the, we wanted to put it out of its misery, but the game laws are so strict that they would not allow us to shoot that lioness. And of course she didn't make it the rest of the day. And we later saw um, her dead. All right, then you had the big cats as well as bears. Um, these are animals that I classify as being extremely high risk and low reward. Why low reward? Um, when I took my lion and I took my leopard, uh, with great honor, the skinners and the trackers asked me down to come where they were working in a part of our camp. And they asked me if I would like to have part of that to eat. Well, you cannot say no. Uh, and so they hand you some of this for you to eat uh, cooked. And um, the problem is with animals that eat grass or grain, um, they have a good taste, a good flavor. Animals that eat uh, other animals and it's sometimes eating carrion like leopards do, um, it just tastes terrible. I mean, you have to almost hold your nose to get it down. Um, so why people would hunt these for food uh, you'd have to be starving to be able to want to hunt one of these. Uh, they have fairly average eyesight, better at night, especially the big cats, um, and kind of average hearing and smell, but they have incredible speed. You cannot believe a lion in his charge. A lion, a male, big male lion, can go from dead still to cover 100 yards in 3.8 seconds. They can beat any brace horse in the world in a hundred yard dash. Um, you have a very low chance of surviving that. Um, they have such powerful claws and what lions do is they, um, they knock you down and then they turn the animal either on its throat or in the case of human beings in the uh, side of your uh, thorax, your middle rib cage, and they just bite and they crush everything. They have jaws that can crush every bone. Um, with leopards, the danger is they eat um, uh, really carry on that's gone bad almost, uh, that's covered in maggots. They love that. 
And so they have um, all kinds of stuff underneath their claws. And if they claw you and cut you open, you may not die from the, uh, from the attack itself, um, but you will die within a few days from the infection, if you, unless you go to a hospital very quick. Um, they live in, in relatively territorial areas, but sometimes, especially like lions, the territory can be quite large. Um, of course, they're extremely dangerous. Um, if you track them, lions um, and leopards to a good bit, but especially lions, uh, will sleep 20 to 22 hours a day. And they don't like to be moved. And if you uh, track them, which is called running the spore, following their tracks, and you get them up from where they're sleeping, usually the first two times they will run away. But by the third time, they're sitting there going to heck with this and they will turn and charge. So almost invariably, you, 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 get, you have to face a charge. And that's, of course, the last thing you really want to have to face. Um, there are brain shots, but I'll show you that they really aren't um, easy to do. And basically heart lungs is all you really got to, uh, to go at. I mentioned earlier that, that man eaters are almost always um, damaged animals. They either have broken canine teeth or especially in Africa, lions, uh, oddly enough, while they, they usually only will attack animals that are greater than about 200 to 250 pounds because it's too much effort for not enough meat for smaller animals. The only exception to that are porcupines. I don't know what it is, but the African porcupine must be like chocolate ice cream to, to lions. They love porcupine meat. But of course, porcupines have got quills all over them. And what they do is they, they run over, over to them and they tump them over and they try to get their paw underneath their stomach area and kill them that way. But almost invariably, they will get a quill or two into their paws. And if they break off, they will fester inside their, their wrist and their paw, and then they can't run as well, and then they'll turn toward something simple like eating people. Uh, here you can see the heart lung shot on a, uh, um, a lion, very large set of lungs uh, for running against prey. The brain is deceptive. You'd think that would be a brain shot, but really not. Everything above the eyes, all of this area up here, is all muscle and gristle, nothing deal. And you can see how deceptively flat the skull is. Here are the eye sockets. There's just nothing up here. And so if you're forced into shooting them to the brain, you have to go through the nose to be able to hit that. But in the prehistoric past, it's back into this area, but why you would hunt a lion, you know, with an atlatl and a dart or a spear, um, you have to be either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. All right, plains game and mountain game. The plains games are relatively low risk um, and high reward, uh, very good tasting meat. Um, I have eaten virtually every type of African antelope there is and they're all good, some better than others. Uh, so good reward. They typically have good eyesight, good hearing, good smell. Um, they obviously, they're very fast uh, and can jump. Some of, of the uh, antelope in Africa can jump 15 to 20 feet uh, over a fence or over, you know, when you scare them, they usually jump straight up in the air and then take off uh, running, uh, springbok or that way. Uh, minimal danger. Most of them aren't going to try to kill you. Um, you typically hunt them by spotting and stalk or tracking. Um, Kill zone is invariably a lung shot. Um, one thing I have discovered is African animals in general are much tougher and harder to, to kill than similar related animals on any other continent. And the only reason I can figure that is that Africa is the most active food chain in the world. You think about it here in North America, really the only predators we have are a few wolves uh, coyotes won't mess with a big animal like a, a big mule deer or an elk. Um, and then you have mountain lions. And we don't really have an active food chain uh, other than human beings. In Africa, you have a number of predators. You have wild dogs, 
uh, you have hyenas, you have lions, you have leopards, you have cheetahs. And so every day in Africa, you know, every antelope has to be faster than the slowest one. <laughs> because you're either going to wake up and live that day or they're going to die and be meat for something. Um, the other interesting thing is noticing it having skinned all these animals and seen them. The position of the heart and lungs, especially the heart, is much lower in the chest in African animals than anywhere else in the world. And I really don't know the explanation for that, only I offer it as, as an observation. Um, here you can see um, models of various uh, antelope, a kudu, and an elk up there in the top, the impala and the African springbok uh, over there on the lower right. You see where the heart and lungs is. On a big animal like an elk, this is a model, this isn't a real one, but um, you see the size of the lungs area here because he lives up in the mountains where oxygen is rare. So you have a huge target area to hit up in here. And with most antelope, if the if you don't hit the heart, if the lungs are punctured, um, they typically don't go all day on you. Um, they will they will bleed out and die within a few hundred yards. Uh, the mountain animals, the wild sheep, the goats, and the ibex, um, it's a huge effort to hunt them because they live in the most incredible rock places up on high in the mountains and on sheer cliff faces. Uh, fairly medium reward. They aren't very big. You know, if, if you had a sheep or a goat that weighed a thousand pounds, it would be worth the effort. But usually they, they weigh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 300 pounds. Um, and then once you get them, you're way up on the top of a, of a mountain and you have to get the meat down. Uh, they have absolutely unbelievable eyesight. Average hearing and smell, their whole protection is high and with their eyes. And they can climb where you can't do it and in places where you don't get your breath. Um, the most incredible ones being those Marco Polo sheep. Um, you hunt those at 14 to 16,000 feet uh, in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzia um, in the southern part of, of Russia, north of, uh, of Iran. And uh, uh, they can just go all day, whereas you can walk maybe 15 yards and you have to stop and breathe. Um, so terrain, falling, the high altitude sickness, all of those are your dangers, not the animals hurting you. Uh, typically, when you hunt them, the key is, yes, you spot and stalk them, but the key is this. You got to get above the animals that you're hunting. Wild game sheep and goats who live high in the mountains never ever look up. They never sense the fact that there's danger above them. They're always looking down. If you can get above them where they never look, you can then stalk downhill and get very close to them. But getting up there is one thing, getting up there without them seeing you is a whole nother thing. And then once you're there, they're what I call slab sided, goats in particular are that way. Uh, and they can take a lot of punishment um, and then go a long way wounded. Uh, they have a very low central nervous system, unlike a deer. A white-tailed deer is very high strung and suffers from, uh, when wounded, uh, from hemorrhagic shock very quickly. Goats and uh, 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 sheep um, with a low central nervous system, they take a lot of hitting and they, uh, they really sometimes don't know that they're dead. And of course you can see the targets for them. Uh, again, it's your heart lung area. They have large lungs to be able to process the amount of oxygen uh, up there in the high altitudes. And that's their weakness and where hunters can attack because you can hit them in this big lung area, that stippled area there. All right. I want to take some last part of my talk of some final hunting observations from someone who has been on, you know, a hundred hunts in every continent around the world and, and, you know, dozens of countries. And these are some things that are my takeaways. And these would be the same things that prehistoric hunters would also uh, tell you if they were here to be able to, to talk. Hunting is a lot more difficult than people think. 
Um, you know, people think that guys drive out there in their vehicles. They never leave their vehicles. They see the animals, they shoot them from the cars and they just go pick them up. Well, there may be some people that do that, but I've never experienced that. Um, success rates on stocks are relatively low. Good hunts that I've been on, I've been able to take an animal after three or four stocks. Sometimes I stock, you know, more than 10 times. Uh, the wind changes, the animal sees you, um, you make a sneeze, whatever it is. Um, and that's really true if the animals have been hunted previously. Now, the first uh, peopling of the Americas, they were coming into a continent full of animals that had never been hunted. So you can imagine that they probably enjoyed a very uh, high success rate early on, but animals learn very quickly. If it was as simple as just driving around and pick them up, they wouldn't call it hunting, they'd call it shopping. Um, knowledge of animal behavior is very important. And this is most important if you're hunting dangerous game. Knowing what I told you before about all the animals and their characteristics and everything else, and the ability to predict what they may do um, is incredibly important. And that's only learned with skill and then experience and then passing that down to the next generation. Uh, animals are harder to spot than you think. We see the zebra with his ridiculous black and white striping, but you put a zebra into cover where the sun is going through leaves and it's creating all kinds of different shadows and a zebra will just stand there invisible. Um, elephants are in gray. If you go back to this picture. I took this picture on an elephant, hunting elephant. This is my professional hunter here. This is what's known as elephant grass. It's 12, 15 feet high. I have been in this material 15 yards, 15 yards from an elephant. I could hear the rumblings of his stomach. I knew more or less the direction he was, but could not see him. And of course, if the first time you see him is when he's right here, then, you know, it can get really exciting. Patience is on the side of the hunter. Animals will stare at you and they will stare. But if you just freeze and stay still and they have no movement or very slow movement, their patients will go faster than you and then they will go back to feeding or look away or whatever. Uh, human beings can always be more patient than an animal can be. Uh, knowledge of animal anatomy is absolutely critical and knowing where that perfect shot is from almost any angle or you need to move to get a better shot um, is incredibly important and I guarantee you that the prehistoric people of the world um, who were hunters very well knew the anatomy of the animals that they were after, probably by trial and error, but then once learned, passed down um, throughout their, their tribal group. Um, there's no substitute for good marksmanship. Um, whether, no matter if your weapon is a spear, a spear thrower, uh, a bow and arrow, um, a rock, <laughs> or a rifle, um, practicing with your weapon is the most important thing. And learning how to get the best shot possible without the, spooking the animal and having him, having him run away, um, I cannot stress how important that is. Um, you never walk across large open areas if possible. You use indirect routes to take advantage of whatever cover is there. Um, I mentioned earlier that the members of the deer family in particular have a very high central nervous system. And as a result, um, they succumb to hemorrhagic shock very quickly. Um, a white-tailed deer, if shot through the lungs, will seldom run more than 50 yards before he bleeds to death. Um, that is just a reality of it. Whereas some of the African animals, especially like a eland, you may chase him for the better part of the rest of the day before you find him. Um, some animals, um, especially caribou and reindeer, uh, but there are others, are very much creatures of habit. 
and they follow seasonal migration routes. Uh, wildebeest in Africa are this way too, year in and year out. And knowing where those routes are, they can then be ambushed and easily killed in certain periods of the year, not year round. Um, I mentioned earlier, most animals do not like uh, wind, rain, cold, wet, uh, except caribou. For whatever reason, maybe because where they live, caribou are impervious to weather. And you can go out trying to find any other animal and you'll never see a moose. You'll never see you know, a bear or something like that, but the caribou will be out. Um, and so you can still hunt caribou when it's uh, in terrible weather, but usually if it's bad weather, it's not much good for hunting. Um, some animals are incredibly curious and that can be exploited. I had read old um, tales from the West of hunters using, and Indians too, of um, taking a bright piece of cloth, bandana or whatever, and putting it on a stick and hiding in a bush and wiggling it in front of our pronghorn antelope and them recording that the antelope would come in and then they would make an easy shot. So one time in Wyoming, I decided to try this. And uh, there was a herd of about 15 antelope and I got hid in the bush and put a red bandana on a stick and just waved it periodically. And they moved from about mm, 800 yards into about 200 yards over a period of about a half hour. And so I can personally uh, attest that that actually works. Um, I did not then shoot those antelopes. I had already killed mine on that hunt, but um, it does indeed work. Um, dikers in Africa, while they are uh, not meat eaters at all, they eat nothing but grass. If you make a call of a distressed animal, like a wounded rabbit or something like that, um, they will come running to it just to see what it is. Uh, they're just curious. And obviously then you can take advantage of that. Um, wild game animals, wild game meat in particular is some of the best for you because it's the leanest without any fat. And as a result, people who are hunter gatherers in areas that um, uh, only have wild game, um, they get fat starved. They actually die to have some fat. And there are a few exceptions. Uh, zebras in particular are kind of sway backed. And when you skin them open, their entire back is covered in a layer of about three to four inches thick of fat. And uh, the African people just love that. They will cook that up, they will eat it, they will use it as grease, uh, whatever. Uh, hippos are the same way. Uh, and as a result, these animals are highly prized uh, by subsistence hunters. Uh, zebra are curious animals and can be uh, relatively easily stalked. Uh, hippos are incredibly dangerous. And uh, they're even more so when they come up on land to feed. If you get between them and the water, they always know their route to the water is safe haven. And if you get between them, they panic and they charge you. And of course, a hippo weighs three tons. And so uh, uh, you're not gonna win that battle. Um, hippos actually kill more people in a year than any other grass eating animal in all of Africa. Um, okay, that's more or less the, uh, the talking points I had. What I wanted to do today was, as I mentioned earlier, not try to convince anybody who is an anti-hunter that you should be a hunter, but the people we study, the prehistoric people we study, and even the historic people that uh, we study, hunting was a very key part of their existence. And everything I have talked about was part of their innate knowledge. You know, oftentimes we think just because they couldn't drive a car or they couldn't run a computer, that they were, you know, our, our prehistoric people were stupid. No, they are very, very intelligent about the things they needed to know. And everything that I had been talking about tonight was the sort of things that they were experts on. They would probably laugh at this talk saying, oh, but you have left out, you know, this, this, and this, because they knew so much about it. 
But you had to know all that. Otherwise, you didn't exist. You starved to death. And so to be successful, you had to know a great deal of this type of uh, animal anatomy and uh, uh, various knowledge of their habitats and their habits. So I thank you very much. Um, I'll open this up uh, if anyone wants to make uh, uh, some questions. Thank you, Dub. So uh, our chat feature is currently disabled. So what I've done, I've allowed folks to be able to unmute themselves if you want to ask a question. Uh, we also have um, some folks on our live stream on YouTube, and if they've got questions, they are welcome to type them in the chat uh, feed there, and I can ask those questions for them. They're on a, about a 20-second delay from us, so uh, if any of those questions come up, I'll just hop in. Otherwise, if y'all have questions for Dub, just unmute yourselves and have at it. I scare everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're all recovering. I had one question, Dub. Sure, Ron. Uh, the, po the poison that they used on the darts to yes. kill the animals uh, circulates through the animals, blood streams, kills them. How does it keep from killing the people that are going to eat it? Yep. The, in the interesting thing, Ron, is that it gets disseminated, and then once the meat is cooked, that uh, tends to ameliorate it, and so they don't die from it. <clears throat> the sad part is um, when they weren't contacted by human being or modern us, uh, they were probably a lot happier, but since uh, they have been in contact with, uh, quote, modern civilization, many of the uh, Kong, Kong and the uh, uh, San peoples um, have, of course, been introduced to alcohol and have become alcoholics. And as a result, um, suicide has become a major problem in their societies. And the, the form of suicide is they will typically just take one of those little arrows and jab it into their thigh. And wow. then they, they lay down and they will die. That's very sad. I had a question of what um, poison you think was used on the um, points in North America for hunting. Well, there are, there are a number of, uh, Leslie Bush could answer this a whole lot better than I can, but there are a number of both um, animal as well as uh, vegetable poisons that could be used. And um, I don't know if the answer is um, that they, you know, used it or not. I just know that, you know, when we, when we collect artifacts, the first thing we do to them is what? We wash them. <laughs> and the moment you wash them, you know, if there's attached um, uh, starch grains, if there's uh, spores attached, if there's anything remnant, maybe from poisons, you probably are removing <laughs> a lot of that. What I would think is that if you saw, like you see in Africa, when they heat those things, um, they become uh, a blackish tar-like substance. And I would think that if we saw remnants of little blackish specks, not so much down on the stem, which could actually be asphaltum for, for using in hafting, but if we saw them more up in the blade itself, and especially on the edges of the blade, um, I would think that that should be worthy of being tested. Where you would go to have that tested, I don't know. Like I say, uh, this lady I've been in contact with in the past, uh, Dr. Valentina Borgia uh, in the UK, um, she has an entire laboratory set up doing this. So she would be the first person I would contact to say, okay, I have a suspect here. How would I go and get that uh, uh, analyzed? Interesting. Okay. I'm, just saying, I'm just saying it's something we never think about and we never look at as North American archeologists, when in reality, I will almost guarantee you that poison was being used somewhere sometime. <clears throat> <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions? Just jump right in. I would just well, like just to like agree to... with uh, Dub there, just that, that 
for some reason, scrubbing the artifacts like that has always bothered me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, I think it's only been fairly recently that but I you think know, that possibly thing, things we like could blood protein something. Though I yeah. understand why it just yeah, has always things things like blood proteins and starch grain analysis is not something that uh, we typically do. Um, I know when I was working with the uh, the Galt project, especially when we were working Area 15, where it was the uh, older than Clovis material. Um, when we first did, Tom Williams and I did um, the uh, trace element geochemistry study using X-ray fluorescence. We did we handled all of the uh, artifacts with uh, plastic gloves, um, so we wouldn't damage any of these things. And before washing or anything else, um, they were all sent out for that type of analysis. And only after we got the data back from it, could you do. Now, sometimes you find some very strange things. I know um, uh, there at Galt, uh, uh, as part of her doctorate, Ashley uh, Lemke uh, re-looked at, at an area um, and she found some um, skinning or some, some knife-like material that she sent out for blood protein analysis. And the interesting thing is they came back positive, but they came back positive with pronghorn antelope. Who would have thought in central Texas, you would have had pronghorn antelope uh, there, but clearly that's the analysis came back. So that would have been information that we would have missed uh, in the past. I am sure that if we did that type of analysis on lone oak material, for example, we would get a lot more information. The trouble is it's a fairly expensive procedures, you know, and, and you know, you have to decide or if you've got enough funds to be able to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody else have any questions for Deb? <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for coming to our meeting tonight. We had a really good turnout of both HAS and Hill Country members and some other guests too. Um, we look forward to seeing you next month. I will be sending out all the information to the Hill Country folks and they'll get it to you. And um, we actually look forward to seeing the Hill Country folks at their meeting because this is going to be a joint effort where we, we share our meetings. So. We look forward to that. Thanks and, so much, Dub. And you've heard me now prattle on for three of the last five months. So I'm not, <laughs> not going to be up here talking for quite some time. <laughs> Great. Uh, good job. Great job, Dub. Thank you so much. Good job, Dub. Thanks. I just hope people understood and had a little better appreciation about it. And I want to say that all of our programs since I think June or July are now on YouTube. So you can go to the HAS YouTube channel and, and look back to our programs um, that we've taped, that we've recorded over the past several months. So thank you so much. And we'll see you guys on the 18th of February. Thanks, Liz, Hi, for running the thank meeting. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Email, Bye, Linda. Bye, everybody. I, I got it, Frank. I'm going to make cornbread. Okay. <laughs>